giving a presentation. Oh, awesome, it's being recorded, good. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about generative adversarial networks and how to connect with materials informatics. Um, generative adversarial networks are also called GANs. That's a shorthand because it's kind of a mouthful if you have to say three very long words every single time. Um, if you have questions, I'd really love to hear them. Um, and I'm sure that Dr. Sparks can uh, relay them to me if you, if you have any. I'd, I'd love to be as interactive as possible. Um, okay, so by way of, of introduction, uh, my name is Ryan Murdoch. I'm a machine learning researcher slash engineer at Adobe. Um, I actually got my bachelor's from, like I'm, I'm not here at the U, but like from here at the U. Um, it was actually in psychology. Um, I worked in Dr. Sparks's lab um, for a summer and then a couple of semesters. And I would highly recommend that if you can do research at the U, you should do it. And, and if you can do it with Dr. Sparks, definitely go for it. Um, so right now I'm currently focused on multimodal image text editing and generation, especially with text guided art. Um, obviously here at Adobe, um, it's important that we kind of like stay on the forefront of what's possible with things like machine learning. So a lot of what my work involves is um, using generative models to edit images or create images, especially with um, text. Um, so, so that's me. Um, so today we will talk about what a generative model is, like just in the broadest sense, um, how they might be useful for material science. Then we'll kind of dig in to generative adversarial network scans specifically and go into some detail. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about materials informatics and GANs and how they can be um, tied together. Then I'll give a little demo. Um, in fact, let's see, it's 11.29. Let me just set a timer to make sure that I have um, enough time for any questions at the end in case I run out, but uh, I'm not too worried. Um, okay, so um, to start, so like I said, I'm an image processing guy. So um, this is an image generated by a GAN. It was posted on Twitter by Melipone, I guess. Um, and the caption is usually, can you name anything in this image? And the answer is, for me, absolutely not. There's nothing in this image that I can understand. So GANs are especially influential and important in the sphere of the sphere of image processing. So that's kind of where I want to start as a stepping stone to then talk about how it might be applied for materials informatics. Um, so, and, and I always just love showing this image because I think it's hilarious. Um, so what are generative models broadly? Um, as you'd expect, they create things, specifically data, and they can do that either conditionally or unconditionally. When a generative model is conditioned on something that's basically saying like, instead of it being fully unsupervised and just taking in images and producing new images, we're including some kind of um, labeling for the images. So for example, um, there's this GAN called Big GAN, and it has an unconditional version and a conditional version. And the conditional version takes in noise, a random vector of noise, a label, and um, then produces an image. And unconditionally, we just throw away the label. We don't use it. So the idea is basically, with unconditional generation, we don't give any information but the images to the network and it still learns to create compelling, interesting images, hopefully. Um, and then conditionally, we give it some labels to say what class we're um, hoping for it to produce. This image is from the Big Gan paper. It is called Dog Ball, and it's a little bit like famous. Um, it's an example of class leakage, and that's basically where you have a conditioned Gan or an unconditioned Gan. I think in this case, in this case, it was conditioned. And the neural network kind of confuses like based on these kind of correlations in the data. So like you would expect a tennis ball to be associated with dogs because dogs love them. You wouldn't expect a dog to be melded with the tennis ball. So this is an example of what happens when different classes that you can potentially condition on are kind of like melded together on accident. Um, 
this is another image that I always like to talk about because I think it's so funny. Um, so in image processing, the state of the art for generative modeling, so going from you know whatever it is you're conditioning on or just noise to images or data or whatever else you're trying to create. Um, so the state of the art is GANs, VQVAEs generally, um, or diffusion models. And I'm going to focus on GANs, but I think there's a lot of interesting work um, being done in image processing and that could be translated into materials informatics that could leverage things like EQVAEs and diffusion modeling. But again, I'll, I'll focus on GANs today. So before I go fully into GANs, we should motivate why we care about GANs and why we think that they could be useful here. Um, let me move this a little bit so you can see the text. Um, so most machine learning and material science, including um, CrabNet, for example, vets materials. So you have a list of materials that you think would be potentially good for some application. And you want to say, OK, what's its bulk modulus? What's its band gap? Um, and so you create a neural network to try and um, not guess, but predict the um, materials um properties from that so so it's basically saying given a material what are its properties likely to be but the question arises of is that the easiest and best way to discover new materials and i think that it's a use it's certainly useful to vet materials and it's a good line of research but i also think that we should be focusing on what's called inverse design where instead of um generating predictions of properties from candidate materials, we generate candidate materials from the properties that we want them to have. Um, so instead of saying, okay, we're going to guess on a thousand different um, a thousand different chemicals what it's going to look like when we um, create it, we're basically going to say this is what we want it to look like when we create it, and then we're going to get the candidates and and, and, and this is called inverse design because instead of um, looking first at the material, you instead look first at the properties that you want it to have. Um, and of course, the application of that could be really good for materials informatics. And if materials informatics does well, um, the whole world benefits by having you know, cheaper batteries, better batteries, um, just a, a massive number of applications for this kind of technology. OK, so let's talk about GANs specifically and about what they are. Um, so they're surprisingly new and yet surprisingly old from 2014. Um, so it's been like, uh, I guess, eight years, um, which is weird to think about. But um, Ian Goodfellow uh, published this paper in 2014, and it exploded everyone was working on GANs, and many people still are for the past many, many years. But um, it has two main components. And these two main components um, are the generator and the discriminator networks. The generator takes in a random vector sampled from a normal distribution. So think of that as just being a whole bunch, a, a list of numbers. So you just get a list of numbers that are randomly sampled. And then it tries to fool the discriminator by taking that random list of numbers as input and creating data. And in most cases, that data comes in the form of images. Um, the discriminator slash critic network tries to identify whether or not the data that is input into it is real from a data set or generated from the generator. And it learns how to discriminate between real and fake slash generated samples. So, so you can call the things that the generator makes synthetic data, um, fake data, generated data. It's, it's trying to imitate the real data in a data set. And the, the discriminator is teaching it how to get better at fooling the discriminator, which, so, so it's kind of this, it's called adversarial because the discriminator is, the whole point of it is to figure out if the GAN is trying to fool it. And in doing so, it teaches the GAN how to better fool it, because you basically just back propagate through the discriminator into the generator. 
um, and adjust the weights until they're both um, really good at identifying real and fake images or you know not very good at it, depending on the stability of your network and generating real or fake images, hopefully. Um, so there are some strengths of generative adversarial networks when you're trying to generate images or compounds or anything like that. One of them is that they learn a rich latent space. I'll talk a little bit more about this, but even if it's unconditional, even if it's only seeing images of faces, it can learn properties of faces and properties of images that are really interesting and useful potentially. Um, and it, if it successfully trains, which is the big if, then it creates sharp realistic images. And I say that that's the big if because GANs are super unstable. It's super hard to train them. Most of the configurations you can think of for training a GAN will totally collapse and not produce good images. Um, but when it works, it works quite well. And I'll show some examples here soon. Um, another factor that is important to think about in both materials informatics and um, image processing is that GANs often only learn typical parts of the data's distribution, the real data's distribution. So one really applied and important example is if you train a generative adversarial network on faces that are mostly not diverse, then you'll get even less diverse results from the GAN most of the time from the generator. Is it yeah. true that they, generally speaking, then ignore the tails? They focus on the main part of the distribution? Yeah, exactly. Like, um, again, the really applied example would be you're training on flowers and you only have like two roses in the data set. You're, you're never going to see those roses from the generator or you're very unlikely to. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's good at accurately and compellingly capturing the data, but it doesn't capture the whole distribution. So you, yeah, you've got these tails that it kind of ignores because in, intuitively it's harder to fool a discriminator if you're trying to generate images that you have very few examples of. And if you're generating images, I mean, the, the batch size is not gonna be the whole data set and the discriminator usually doesn't have access to what else is in the batch, although there are some GANs that do that. Um, there's one called Pack GAN where the discriminator sees like a whole grid of images instead of just one image to say like, okay, is this actually capturing the diversity of the data set? But, but ultimately with adversarial training, yeah, it's always going to be like ignoring things that are hard to make or uncommon because it's just trying to fool the discriminator um, in the first place. Okay. Um, so what can a GAN learn without supervision? This is style GAN. It's a really important um, instance of a GAN trained on faces. Um, it's really broadly used um, by a lot of people for a lot of projects. And um, in this instance, it is trained just on faces with nothing else, um, no other, you know, no, no like supervision or labels. And so as you can see, it learns to produce these really pretty lifelike faces. Um, at pretty high resolution. And when you move through the latent space, I'll talk about what that is in a second, but when you move through the latent space, you see that you get these faces that have meaningful shifts. Instead of it just being like an alpha blur between faces, you can see that like it's moving between properties of those faces. So um, while this kind of like hypnotic transfixing image is going, I mean, video is going, I'll talk a little bit about like what the latent space is. So the latent space is basically the, um, the um, space of potential vectors that you can pull out of a um, Gaussian distribution and then feed into a generator. So you can think of the latent space as being a whole bunch of potential inputs to the network that will produce an image. And so what you can do is because the latent space in this instance is totally continuous, is you can interpolate. Um, it's kind of like linear and it, it's like lerping, but it's actually spherical lerping, which is weird, but I won't get into that. Um, you can basically say when we pull a random number and then move to a different random number um, that we also pull from the same normal distribution, um, we can 
look at the properties as we move from one point in the latent space to another, and we can see that they change in meaningful ways. So um, you have like a, I might talk about this a little bit more here. Yeah, so you might have 512 numbers in a list, a vector basically. Um, so, you, so you have these 512 numbers and they're sampled from a normal distribution. You pick a point and you'll make a face from it. You pick another point and you can see that as you move through that latent space, the properties uh, change in a meaningful way, um, which is which is really cool. And also, as we've shown recently um, at Adobe, um, useful for editing images. So, well, real quick, Ryan, I've got a yeah, question. Yeah. What if instead of pulling from a normal distribution, you you pulled from a different distribution that paid more attention to the tails, like a T student, or I mean, we just talked about those T S and E, right? But there's other distributions. What does that do in terms of finding things away from the average values? Yeah, so I think that um, there are probably theoretical reasons that people started with a normal distribution and have generally stuck to it. But um, you could use you could technically use a uniform distribution. I think that empirically a normal distribution just kind of works better um but one interesting point is that if you're like trying to get more so so you have your normal distribution you've got your long tails in the big GAN paper what they do to improve sample quality at the cost of diversity is they truncate the normal distribution so there there are there is a lot of stuff going on where you can say like okay if we truncate the normal distribution we'll get samples that are of higher quality it's called the truncation trick for that reason but you also trade you 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 trade off diversity because it's kind of like you've got your latent space neighborhood that's like very expected because obviously most values are near zero and so you can truncate it and say like okay make this a very safe looking dog or a very safe looking face but then yeah you trade off diversity because those far away further out less common values um, are chopped off. So I don't know. It, I, I, I'm sure that people have tried training with like a uniform distribution. And I think that it probably doesn't work as well because the it's kind of like the universe is kind of like a normal distribution in that your samples properties are likely to fall along a normal distribution. So it's easier to say like, okay, most of the time people have that have eyes in a very similar part of their face. So we want that to be usually, we, we want that to be kind of Gaussian. But um, yeah, I think there's a lot of potential for like trying to see like, can we, um, in fact, I, I did a little bit of work on this. Can we basically like traverse the latent space to find samples that are um, good, but still um, not average, you know? So, so yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting and good question about like why a normal distribution and can we improve on that? Thank you. Yeah, totally. I'll hold up another question. Cool. Let's, I assume that style again and for the video you showed was trained on just all headshots, you know, fairly similar headshots sort of thing. If you gave it half headshots and then half full body, Shots, would it start putting faces on their stomachs or, you know, is that the kind of data leakage you're talking about? Yeah, so, um, sorry, I think I, I couldn't totally hear, but I think I got the gist of it. Yeah, there's this thing where you have GANs that are called aligned GANs, and then you have GANs that are like unaligned. And there's this idea of like, okay, so we're always cropping the face to look and be in the center of the image in the exact same like angle as much as possible. So what happens if we train it with like full body images or just like half and half? And, and the answer is that it, the, the generator has a lot harder time figuring that out. There's actually this new paper that I really want the code to come out from called like StyleGAN XL, where they've basically done that. They said, we're not going to align the images at all. We're just going to train on ImageNet. And then we're going to say, OK, do your best. So, so um, it is possible to train on not just headshots. It's just a lot harder. And, and you'll end up getting probably lower um, quality of results because the GAN will have a harder time capturing the distribution accurately and, and all that. But um, 
there's something else about that that was interesting let me think um but yeah i mean there, there's certainly a lot of work to kind of free the gan from like having to only focus on because because there are like big gan isn't aligned but um it's, it's just harder to train um again when it doesn't always know like exactly what to accept, expect exactly in the same place so yeah that's a that's a really good question thanks ryan yeah so um so yeah so we find that the um or i shouldn't say we i should say adobe researchers found that the directions in latent space are um, meaningful. So like you can have one point and you can take this linear. So just adding a list of numbers to the latent code and you can say, okay, take me from any random face in the latent space and make it blonde. And it can, and you can do that, which is really powerful because that means that you can just add two numbers together um, and then have an edited face after one addition and one forward pass. But one thing you'll notice is here's the original face or the inverted face, because you've got to find like a doppelganger in the latent space of style GAN. But so here's a face in style GAN. You can say, make it a man with a beard or make it a blonde man. But because the latent space um, isn't perfectly disentangled, you end up, and, and what does that mean? Well, it means this, you end up with blonde men are according to style GAN, potentially more likely to be tan. I, I don't know why that was picked up in the data, but it apparently is something that it picked up. So you end up with these, these latent directions that try to um, only affect like hair color and they end up affecting skin tone. They end up affecting um, like the lighting of the image, which is interesting because it shows that the GAN is learning these disentangled representations, but they're still sort of entangled. And some of those entanglements include, in the case of faces, um, human, like, like, like biases about humans just because of the co-occurrence within the images in the data set. So, so that's a really um, kind of important thing to be thinking about is that GANs can learn things without supervision. They don't always learn exactly what you want and, and, and in a perfectly clean like way. Because ideally it would be like, okay, add 15 to one of the numbers in the 512 list and get out um, a blonde man. But um, ultimately all of these different constructs and different properties in the latent space are still kind of wrapped together and we have to work to tease them apart. Okay, so um, one thing that I think is really funny is that from 2014 until like 2021, probably, there were, you know, probably thousands of GAN papers. And a lot of them were really good and important and useful. And some of them did not actually help. And we'll never, there are just so many that I don't think we'll ever know what percentage were good. But so I'll start with DC again, which was, Definitely, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but DC GAN is a deep convolutional GAN. And instead of using a multi layer perceptron where it's just like linear feed forward layers, you're using convolutions, which I assume you've talked about. But if you haven't, it's like sliding a filter of neurons over an image. So the DC GAN was important, and most GANs for images use deep convolutions and build on that. Then you have the Wasserstein GAN, the Wasserstein. GAN gradient penalty, the instant condition GAN, the big GAN, the cycle GAN, the spectral normalization GAN, the cat GAN, and the V GAN. And um, so there are just a ton of different papers out there um, on GANs from this time period. And a lot of them had some really fun um, naming schemes. But here's a link um, to, it's called the GANZU. If you Google that, you'll find it. And it's just like a list of all of the GAN names people could collect, which I thought was kind of cute. Okay, so now on to materials informatics. So how would we um, apply this type of system to uh, materials informatics? And so I'm just really quickly gonna talk about this one um, paper uh, that did, I think, a 
pretty decent job. Um, and, and also I just really like this figure because I think it lays it out, lays it out quite well. But so let's say that you want to generate um, samples. In this case, they're gonna be uh, chemicals. So like, you know, different, what, so, so what do we mean by chemicals and how do we represent that? In this case, they represent chemicals as just these one hot, meaning it's either a zero or a one in each row slash column, depending on what orientation we're looking at. Um, these one hot matrices. So, so basically, if you had like nitrogen and aluminum, you would have all zeros in this matrix, except in the place where you say how many nitrogens there are and how many aluminums there are. Um, there you would have a one. So the so the rows determine what elements it is. The columns determine how many of them there are, and that's how they're representing a chemical. So and Ryan, so, yeah, I saw this paper, and I thought that was a funky way to do the composition-based feature yeah. vector. Um, is there an advantage to this over just like fractional encoding, which is what we've been doing? So I think that um, I remember thinking about this a lot. Um, before I went into like psychology research because I was really wanting to do this kind of work. But um, if you do fractional encoding, it's, well, let me think about it. So I guess if you represent it as like a mat to vec, um, uh, as like a mat to vec uh, feature where it's like basically an embedding, what ends up happening is the generator is never going to get good at fooling the discriminator into thinking that it knows the exact embeddings or it's going to make up embeddings. So it's going to create chemicals that don't exist or it's going to have a really hard time creating chemicals that do exist and it's just going to fail. So yeah, it's representing chemical space is hard and representing chemical space and structure space, which is something that we were thinking about is like really, 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 really hard because you need to think about, um, oh, sorry, I've got like five minutes, but I'll try to be quick about this part because I think um, I'll just send out a link to the demo. But um, yeah, so I think that um, representing the chemicals or the structures is the hardest part of building a GAN for materials informatics because there, the chemicals are obviously um, a fractional amount and a discrete unit, and GANs are really bad at discrete units. So here they end up using a sigmoid layer to try and like say, okay, it's either zero or one, and it's not very in between. You could use like a Gumbel softmax layer and try and do that as well, but it's always really hard to get a GAN to do discrete units, and it's also hard to get a GAN to do like exact um, embeddings as well. So, so ultimately, I think that, um, yeah, ultimately, I think that the way that you represent it is probably the hardest part of this kind of thing, the way that you represent your materials. But um, yeah, so in this case, they just have like a usual noise vector. I think they probably conditioned on some property or wanted to move in that direction. They generated fake samples where it was a one hot, but it was a sigmoid function. So basically, that's an S curve, where it's uh, really hard to stay in the middle. So it tends towards being 0 or 1 to some degree. And so um, they did this one hot table. Then the discriminator takes that in, processes it, says whether or not it's real. I don't like that they have fine tuning here, because it's really just training. Fine tuning has come on to take like a different meaning in machine learning. But anyways, this is the back propagation from the discriminator to the generator teaching both the ge generator and the discriminator. Um, so the discriminator gets better at saying, is this real or fake? And they have, of course, the real samples from the data set. And the generator gets better at pooling the discriminator in this way. And yeah, I mean, the paper, um, I'm trying to remember uh, if they talked about this. No, yeah, they did talk about this. The paper touches on how um, in the real samples, they didn't have many examples of some data, so like some um, chemicals. And when they looked into it, the generator was 
almost never generating those chemicals. So this goes back to that earlier slide saying, GANs can make some really convincing sharp data, but can they make it throughout the whole distribution? And the answer is potentially not. Okay. So, um, so open questions, could you add structure to the mix? That's really hard. How can we best represent materials? That's again, like probably the hardest part. And are there other approaches that may make more sense? So for instance, you could say, what if we use natural language processing NLP techniques that are already meant to work on discrete units like an atom or like an element? And what if we tried to apply those there? So you could think of like a GPT-2, but for, um, but, but like, um, the, I mean, the big problem is transformers are so data hungry, but you could think of like building a language model, but instead of being language, it's on chemical systems and it's conditioned on their properties, which I think there is some potential there, but I don't know. Then there's VAE, so variational autoencoders, which I think Dr. Sparks will talk about later. And then diffusion models, I don't even know how they'd be used here, but interesting to think about because they're showing a lot of promise in image processing, but yeah. Okay, any questions? There's probably a few questions. Yeah. Ryan, we've got a paper I'll have to show you soon. We are doing some cool things with GANs and materials and representing them. We're, we're not doing, well, we're starting with structure. Uh, like we're saying first it has to obey symmetry and then we're adding chemistry to it. So right now we have, we have things that look at least realistic and we did that by adding all sorts of things. We added LSTM layers. I think that's because as you make these things bigger and bigger, that vanishing gradient, you're losing the ability to, to, to get that information all the way back to the generator and adding LSTM layers seemed to help us. Um, but we, we still haven't figured out the problem of chemical things. So for example, when it predicts a, a structure, the structure now looks good if it's just like balls on a screen. But as soon as you realize that it's like, oh, it's putting neon together with like cesium, you're like, oh, that's nonsense. Or it'll, if you look at like the bond distribution in our things that we are outputting, they're total nonsense. So adding, it, it's hard. It, you, you've shown an example where they, did, they started with chemistry and they only predict a formula basically. But what we tried to do was start with the information in the civ file and that also doesn't work. So combining those two is really where we're at right now. And I think we've got some core cool results to show. I'll, I'll have to, next time I see you, I'll, I can show you or send you the link to the paper. Question yeah, from exciting. So does the um, generator ever see real data? Does the generator see real data? No. Yeah, yeah. It, it, uh, um, there, are, there are some variational autoencoders where like you encode the data and then you like edit the data, but with a with a pure GAN, um, where you're just using a generator, it, it, it only sees the gradients from the um, discriminator. Yeah. VAEs must be more stable because there's not two separate uh, tools, right? It's just an encoding step. It's all part of the neural network, but I imagine they're much more stable. Yeah, I think I think um, in image processing, they they've started to do this thing. A lot of people where they train a VAE, but they have an adversarial loss. So they're like, okay, you know, make this, make this, uh, make this image and then say, edit it and then make sure that it stays like sharp. So that's, that's one thing that, yeah. So one of the things uh, that has been important, and I know in our model is how we normalize the layers, there's spectral, there's batch. Do you want to talk about that? What is that talking about? It has to do with the loss function, right? Yeah. So for a long time, and I think still to some extent, people were like, why does batch normalization work? What does it even do? And um, I think there's still some controversy over that. But I think the general idea is to say, OK, we've got these outputs and we've got these gradients. We want to um, either within the batch or somewhere else, zero center them and make them um, have a, uh, a you know, standard deviation of one. Um, but I, th yeah, I think that I'm not certain about batch norm, especially, but I think the general idea is to make it so that you don't have exploding gradients and so that you have, um, these, uh, representations that are invariant to like massive changes in scale, I guess. So. Okay. Other questions students have? Yeah. How does, um, seems like an outlier, uh, as far as like real sharpness goes. So 
The question had to do with outliers again, right? So again, if materials informatics, if, if our goal is to extrapolate out to find these unusual behaviors, um, he, he's saying it looks like GANs aren't going to work for that. And I, and I would agree. I don't think they are going to work for that. If you're predicting a structure or a chemical formula, I think it's going to give you a whole bunch of genuinely new things, but that are in the realm of common ones that you train from. So if that's a property, I don't think that this is a tool that will excel in extrapolation, unless we can change it in some way. Yeah, I, I tend to agree that um, if you're using an adversarial loss and you don't have like a massive amount of data, it's, it's, it's very difficult to be able to say like, okay, here's something that is, um, you know, extrapolated. It's, it's much better at interpolation than, than extrapolation. Other questions? Got time for maybe one more? Um, well, I will show you an example of our latest and greatest in this area and talk more about GANs, um, but this was a great primer. Ryan, we appreciate it. You're, when I think GANs, you come right to mind. You've done some really cool stuff with them. Um, if you want to send that link to your notebook, um, I, I'll share, share it with them. If they've got questions, can they get in touch with you and ask about it? Yeah, absolutely. Let me, um, I can, I, I guess my email is just um, rmurdoch at adobe.com these days. So. Yeah, feel free to send me any questions or things like that. I, I, I'd definitely be happy to correspond. Thank you so much, Ryan. We appreciate it. Nice to see you again. Yeah, thank you. See ya. Yeah.